Good. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. This is the eighth year of the health care fraud takedown. This event highlights the enormity of the health care fraud problems we face. This problem is compounded by the fact that our country is in the midst of the deadliest drug crisis in our nation's history, causing more deaths than we've ever seen in our nation. Indeed, an extraordinary number of the cases that we will be highlighting today that are in our report uh, involve opioid prescription abuse. One American dies of a drug overdose every 11 minutes, and more than 2 million Americans are ensnared in addiction to prescription painkillers. Every day, as a result of drug abuse, American families are being bankrupted, broken apart, friendships ended, and promising lives and careers cut short. Drug addiction is causing more and more crime and violence in our communities across this nation. Too many trusted medical professionals, like doctors and nurses and pharmacists, have chosen to violate their oaths and put greed ahead of their patients. Amazingly, some have made their practices into multi-million dollar criminal enterprises. They seem oblivious to the disastrous consequences of their greed. These, their actions not only enrich themselves, often at the expense of the taxpayer, but also feed addictions and cause addictions to begin. The consequences are real. The emergency rooms, jail, jail cells, futures lost, and graveyards are the results. And so today, the Department of Justice, in conjunction with the Department of Health and Human Services, is announcing the largest health care fraud takedown operation in American history. The Department of Justice coordinated efforts between our criminal divisions, U.S. Attorney's Offices, uh, health, care, health and Human Services, and more than 1,000 state, local, and federal law enforcement agents to charge 412 defendants, including 56 doctors. These defendants have defrauded taxpayers of approximately $1.3 billion. As a result of this operation, 205 health care providers are now in the process of being suspended or banned from participation in any federal health care programs. Among those defendants announced today, 120 have been charged with opioid-related crimes, making this also the largest opioid-related fraud takedown in American history. One group of defendants, including six doctors, are alleged to have operated a scheme in Michigan to prescribe patients with unnecessary opioids, some of which ended up for sale on the streets. These defendants allegedly billed Medicare for $164 million in false and fraudulent claims. One fake rehab facility for drug addicts in Palm Beach is alleged to have recruited addicts with gift cards, visits to strip clubs, and even drugs enabling the company to bill for more than $58 million in false treatments and false tests. Another illegal clinic in Houston allegedly gave out prescriptions for cash. Just one doctor, one doctor at this clinic allegedly gave out 12,000 opioid prescriptions for over 2 million illegal painkiller doses. These defendants have been charged and they will face justice. While today is a historic day, the department's work is certainly not finished. In fact, it is just beginning. We will continue to find, arrest, prosecute, convict, and incarcerate fraudsters, drug dealers, wherever they are. We will use every tool we have to stop criminals from exploiting vulnerable people and stealing our hard-earned tax dollars. We are continuing to work hard to develop even more techniques to identify and prosecute wrongdoers. We are sending a clear message to criminals across this country. We will find you, we will bring you to justice, and you will pay a very high price for what you have done. So I want to thank our great 
my great friend and superb secretary of Health and Human Services, Tom Price, for his leadership and partnership and for sharing his expertise as a renowned physician and uh, leading his team members in this effort. I want to also thank the dedicated HHS personnel for their valuable assistance. I want to thank all the Department of Justice, and you'll hear from them today, uh, for the, the attorneys and staff and agents who've worked together to make this successful announcement. They have made the entire Department of Justice proud. Above all, I think we owe a major debt of gratitude to the over 1,000 law officers involved in these cases. I want to thank them for their, and their families for the service and commitment they've given to their country. Thank you, and now I'll turn the program over to Secretary Price. Tom? Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Turn Channel. Good morning to you. Uh, I appreciate you uh, for hosting this event, and thanks to all of you for, for being here. Uh, I'd like to begin by recognizing those folks who are not able uh, to be here today, uh, but without whom this event would not be possible. Uh, as the Attorney General mentioned, to the thousands of men and women serving in state and federal law enforcement agencies on the front lines of battling health care fraud in America, thank you for your hard work and your heroism that have brought so many criminals to justice. Health care fraud is a crime that deserves special condemnation and requires special cooperation to combat. Not only does it involve stealing billions of taxpayer dollars from America's seniors and the medically needy, but it also undermines the American people's trust in their health care system and in our, in our nation's most important public institutions. As a physician and as Secretary of Health and Human Services, I can tell you that that distrust is oftentimes misplaced. America has the best doctors and health care providers in the world, but their ability to provide affordable, high-quality care to their patients is jeopardized every single time a criminal commits, commits health care fraud. So it's important to recognize that the individuals targeted within our takedown operations are in the business not of caring for patients, but of manipulating them and exploiting them. Now, with a name like the National Health Care Takedown uh, Fraud, Broad takedown, you might think uh, that this operation arrests mostly physicians, and in some cases they do, but that's not the case but for the majority. In fact, it's not even close. This year's takedown involved over 412 charged defendants, but the vast majority of them are not physicians or health care providers. And even those defendants who do have a medical license in practice, they are not true medical professionals, they're professional criminals. This is especially true of the criminals who prey on some of the most vulnerable in our society, the millions of people struggling with drug addiction. For most Americans, the opioid crisis, tearing apart families and communities all across our land is a cause of great sadness and of sympathy. But a few individuals look at this national scourge and they see an opportunity to profit from their fellow citizens' suffering and pain. And that's why this year's national takedown operation aggressively targeted individuals who have maliciously contributed to America's opioid epidemic while also engaging in health care fraud. Thanks to the efforts, these efforts, fewer criminals will be able to exploit our nation's opioid crisis for their own gain. And more people struggling with addiction will be able to get the help and the treatment that they need. And this really epitomizes what the national takedown operation is all about. More than 50 years ago, America's tradition of helping our neighbors in need inspired a generation to create Medicare and Medicaid, programs that provide critical health care services to America's seniors and those most vulnerable. Now it's our generation's challenge to keep the promises of these programs and to protect them for our children and for our grandchildren. And this requires relentlessly pursuing anyone involved in defrauding our nation's health care programs someone who instinctively understands the importance of saving and strengthening Medicare and Medicaid for future generations is President Donald Trump. We saw this in his first budget request, which called for a new $70 million investment in the health care fraud and abuse control program through HHS. And we saw it in his choice for Attorney General. And we will continue to work collaboratively with the Department of Justice and the Attorney General in this area and look forward to much more success. 
It's now my privilege to turn the podium over to the Inspector General for the Health and Human Services Department, Dan Levinson. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and thank you, Mr. Attorney General, and good morning. As you've heard today, today's action marks the nation's largest criminal health care fraud takedown in history. This has been a massive operation requiring the expertise and coordination of more than a thousand federal, state, and local law enforcement personnel including nearly 350 agents from our Office of Inspector General. I'd like to thank our OIG agents who have worked so hard over many months to achieve this remarkable and unprecedented multi-agency enforcement operation. I'd also like to thank our federal and state partners who share our commitment to fight fraud in Medicare and Medicaid in particular, I am deeply grateful to the 30 state Medicaid fraud control units who participated in the takedown, coordinating our prevention, detection, and enforcement efforts with our partners is crucial to our success in combating health care fraud. And I do want to underscore the importance of the health care fraud control units at the state level, because in many cases, uh, these investigators who have worked many years in fields of requiring great expertise and experience are really unsung heroes and it's a rather complicated acronym Medicaid fraud control units uh, to think about in an acronym uh, heavy city uh, but we greatly appreciate and I know I speak for all of our criminal investigators who work so hard uh, to bring these law enforcement actions uh, to an effective close I know I speak for our whole team when I express my deep appreciation to nearly every state's Medicaid fraud control unit. Uh, 49 of the 50 states have one, and uh, they play a critical part in ensuring the integrity of both federal and state funds distributed through state Medicaid programs. Together, we apprehended individuals who are suspected of defrauding vital health care programs out of more than $1 billion. This is reprehensible, as health care fraud not only represents a theft from taxpayers who fund these vital programs, but affects the millions of Americans who rely on quality care in Medicare and Medicaid. In the worst fraud cases, greed overpowers care, putting patients' health at risk. OIG sees this all too often in fraud cases involving the illegal prescribing and dispensing of opioids. This takedown included 120 individuals charged with fraud relating to opioids. And in addition to the charges announced today, OIG is issuing exclusion notices to nearly 300 physicians, nurses, and other providers based on conduct related to opioid diversion and abuse. These individuals will be prevented from billing all, all federally funded health care programs. And later this morning, our office will post a report regarding the questionable prescribing of opioids in Medicare's prescription drug program. <clears throat> of note is that Medicare spent over $4 billion in opioids in 2016. One in every three Medicare beneficiaries received a prescription opioid. Over half a million beneficiaries received what is considered high amounts of opioids. And more than 400 prescribers had questionable opioid prescribing patterns for beneficiaries at serious risk. Our OIG will continue to play a vital leadership role in the Medicare fraud strike force to track down those who abuse important federal health care programs. We're committed to holding accountable those who threaten the integrity of all HHS programs and the health of every American who relies on these programs. Uh, thank you, and I'd now like to turn our press conference over to FBI Acting Director Andy McCabe. Good morning. I want to join the Attorney General and Secretary Price in thanking those folks who do the hard work that make these cases possible, especially my FBI agents and analysts in the Criminal Investigative Division 
in the healthcare fraud unit, and in the 29 FBI field offices who participated across the country in the enforcement actions we're talking about this morning. And of course, I have to thank our partners in the federal agencies and at the state and local level, and particularly on the Medicare Fraud Strike Force teams. Without their assistance, we would not be here today. So these folks are the ones on the front lines in the fight against healthcare fraud. And this takedown is an incredible example of the success of that partnership. It's obvious to anyone who picks up a newspaper or turns on the news that the nation is in the midst of a crisis. Opioid abuse destroys lives, and it devastates families. It's become so prevalent that the number of related opioid-related deaths increases each year. And these overdoses aren't just happening in some places, they're happening every place. They're happening in towns and communities all across the country. Men and women of all ages, of all races, and all backgrounds fall victim to it. Narcotics officers have arrested school teachers, doctors, nurses, and fellow law enforcement personnel. And many who succumb to the lure of the opiate high are kids. Kids who took one wrong turn and became hooked. This week we arrested once trusted doctors, pharmacists, and other medical professionals who were corrupted by greed. These people inflicted a special kind of damage. They not only defrauded Medicare, Medicaid, and TRICARE out of many millions of taxpayer dollars, they preyed on the vulnerable, distributing powerful opioids to people they knew were hooked on them. In some cases, we had addicts packed into standing room only waiting rooms, waiting for those prescriptions. We have doctors who wrote unnecessary narcotics prescriptions to addicts and drug dealers in return for $250, $300 cash payments for each visit. Some doctors wrote out more prescriptions for controlled substances in one month than entire hospitals were writing. To opioid addicts, these prescriptions escalate their dependence on drugs. They are a death sentence, plain and simple. The FBI's role in fighting healthcare fraud continues to be a priority for us. FBI special agents and analysts work these cases in all 56 of our field offices. And as I said earlier, 29 of our FBI field offices took part in this week's national healthcare takedown. And that includes the efforts of about 370 FBI personnel who worked on that team of over a thousand law enforcement folks that you've heard referred to this morning. We know that we need to be proactive in stopping opioid abuse. And that's why our healthcare fraud unit has started the prescription drug initiative. The object of the PDI is to pursue medical professionals who overprescribe opioids, as well as those who seek to profit from the diversion of prescription narcotics. We in law enforcement know that we cannot tackle this problem alone. We've got to work with our public health, treatment professionals, and educators to increase public awareness about the perils of opioid addiction. This year's National Healthcare Fraud Takedown removes dozens of corrupt medical professionals from serving the public. And we hope that these arrests will deter other doctors and nurses and pharmacists from the lure of easy money at the expense of the most vulnerable. And as we all know, when providers steal from government healthcare programs, they decrease the resources available to those programs and to the taxpayers they were meant to serve. And that hurts us all. Now I'd like to turn things over to Acting DEA Administrator Chuck Rosenberg. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. My genuine thanks to those who investigate and prosecute these cases. Uh, the agents, task force officers, diversion investigators, analysts at DEA, and our partners here around the country, prosecutors and agents who are doing real hard work uh, in making all of this possible. Coordination and cooperation are the uh, hallmark of effective law enforcement, and so I appreciate uh, the joint efforts here. DEA is both a law enforcement agency, as I think you know, uh, and also a regulatory agency, as you may not know. Some folks don't know that we regulate 1.7 million individuals and businesses, uh, all of whom are registered with the DEA. And these, these registrants 
represent the entire drug supply chain. So manufacturers, distributors, doctors, pharmacies, and pharmacists, among others. Now, the vast majority of these professionals are good folks. In fact, the vast majority of these professionals are allies of ours. They help us. Uh, however, the few who don't and who aren't have an outsized impact on public health and safety. Prescription and over-the-counter uh, drugs are among the most commonly abused substances by Americans aged 14 and over. And among prescription medications, hydrocodone number one and oxycodone number two, both of which are very powerful opioids, uh, lead the way. Uh, used and monitored properly, these drugs can bring great relief to people with severe pain. Uh, used improperly, they are extraordinarily dangerous. We also know that there is a causative and correlative relationship between addiction to prescription pills and addiction to heroin. There's two really daunting numbers. Four out of five new heroin users start on prescription pills. And in the United States, we have about 600 new heroin users each day, which is remarkable. So we need to change the culture in the United States. We have to, rem we have to dramatically reduce the demand for prescription pills and the other dangerous drugs such as heroin to which they lead. Now, changing the culture is hard. It can be done. Because if we do it, if we change the culture, we're going to save lives. But we also need to prosecute those that disregard the law. Their recklessness and their greed puts Americans at significant risk of addiction and death. Now, last year, here's another remarkable number. 59,000 people, an estimated 59,000 people died from a drug overdose. Now, sometimes big numbers wash over us, so I want to give you another way to think about that big number. If you recall about a year ago, and I'm sure you do, 49 innocent people were murdered at the Pulse nightclub by a madman. Now imagine that happening three times a day, once in the morning, once in the afternoon, and once in the evening. And then imagine that happening 365 days in a row. And even that number, and I've done the math for you so you don't have to, doesn't come out to 59,000 people a year. Now of course that's for all drugs but opioids play an enormous role uh, in that total number. Fatal overdoses linked to the misuse of prescription drugs and other drugs to which they inevitably lead is really truly an epidemic. I know we overuse certain words in our lexicon like unprecedented and historic and unique. This is an epidemic. With great privilege and with great authority comes great responsibility to handle and prescribe controlled drugs lawfully, carefully, and thoughtfully. Where and when pr practitioners uh, fall, fail and fall in that responsibility, uh, we are going to hold them accountable. Hey, thanks for your time. Let me turn it back over to General Sessions. All right. Okay, we'll have some questions. Okay. Attorney General Sessions, can you tell us, explain how this largest ever healthcare fraud case began? Uh, in places like Michigan and Florida, how did your investigators find out about it? How did they investigate it? Was it tips? Can you just give us some sense of that? Yeah, uh, it starts in, first I would, and maybe some of our experts who actually started those investigations can tell you, but the inspector generals of HHS work on those cases. We get tips from people in the community. Uh, we're now running very sophisticated computer programs that identify outliers, some really bad outliers. I mean, they jump right out at you. It's like, uh, how could this possibly, how could a physician or pharmacy move these many pills? And so I think that's the kind of thing that leads us to uh, these investigations. And then you've got 94 United States Attorney's Offices. You've got, what, 56 FBI resident agencies. Uh, DEA is all over the country. So working with the... Um, uh, team at HHS and local uh, law enforcement and uh, agencies, uh, these cases are moving forward. We think and actually are committed to getting even better at this. We believe there are a lot more cases that need to be brought. We want to send a message to those who are violating the law that we're coming after you. Uh, we would like to see uh, as uh, Chuck Rosenberg at DEA indicated, a reduction in the prescription of opioids by 
our medical community. I believe those numbers are way too high. The United States is by far the highest prescribing opioid nation in the world. No nation is close to it. And I think that is a cause of addiction. DEA has indicated and, and their d data show that 80% of heroin addicts, they believe, started uh, with opioid prescription drugs. So it's a big issue for us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Attorney General. Two questions, one on topic, one off topic. A lot of opioid addiction advocates say they're disappointed with the Trump administration so far. A lot of people voted for President Trump because he promised to reduce the epidemic and up treatment. But so far, they tell me what they've seen are proposed cuts to treatment. Um, a commission headed by Governor Chris Christie, which many many people say is, is unnecessary and will take too long. And then lastly, many people take issue with you and your hardline stance with sentencing and worry that too many people will wind up in prison and not treatment. So can you articulate, wait, I think you started it with your answer to Sari's question, what is the Trump administration's strategy in combating the opioid epidemic? We have got to work together and maybe some of these others would like to contribute uh, to, to confront this rising drug use Crime is rising with it. Uh, we've seen opioid and other drug deaths at the rate we've never, ever seen before. So there are three ways to deal with the drug uh, rising drug epidemic. One is prevention, which I believe will work. History showed it worked in the 80s and the 90s. We need to have a reinforced message that to stay away from these drugs, minimize your exposure to them, don't get started, and you won't get addicted. Uh, in 1980, 1980, over 50% of high school seniors in America acknowledged using an illegal drug. And about 15 years later, that had been cut to less than half that number. Uh, so that's the first thing, get fewer people moving into it. Law enforcement does, in fact, have a critical role to play in this. Uh, we simply, as part of prevention, it's part of uh, stopping the distri distribution networks out there, and it played a big part in the reduction of drug use, too, in the 80s and 90s. And so I think the third thing is, is treatment. And we try to do all we can on the treatment agenda, but it's not a cure-all. Many people go in and out of treatment. They, they're not successful. Often their lives are ended by this addiction. They never overcome the addiction. So preventing addiction, preventing addiction is the most important thing that we can do. And we can help people uh, who are addicted, but it's still a rough road. Now, Tom, let, excuse me. Let, let, let me just... What you were combating in the 1980s was very different than what you face today. Are you saying that you believe the same strategies that were used to combat street drugs can be used to combat the prescription opioid epidemic? Abs well, essentially the three principles I just announced, the way you uh, fight back against drug addiction. Uh, I do believe the prescription problem is different. We're going to step up our efforts on that. We've never seen this kind of uh, deaths from prescription drugs as well as heroin and fentanyl. Uh, the death rate is much higher than it was in the 80s. The purity of drugs today are much higher. Even marijuana is more uh, potent. But heroin is up to 80% often. And I'm told that... Uh, uh, oh, I remember it was 20% or 15% on street drugs in, in the 80s. So this is an extraordinary thing. And you throw fentanyl in it and you get death. Yeah. Let, let, let me make this really clear. The president is absolutely committed uh, to ending this crisis. Um, a couple of years ago, the amount of money that the administration put into fighting the opioid crisis uh, was about $250 million. Uh, FY17, $811 million. So the amount of money is increasing significantly. The president is absolutely committed to making certain that we stem that tide. The commission is just one portion of, of the strategy. Uh, and the commission wasn't put together to come back in one year, two year, four years and, and make some recommendations. The commission's charged with coming forward with recommendations this fall, uh, and they're on track to be able to do so. Uh, at Health and Human Services, we've developed a five-point strategy to address the, uh, the opioid crisis, which involves, as the Attorney General said, prevention, treatment, and, and recovery. Uh, in addition to that, making certain that overdose-reversing drugs, naloxone and Narcan, are available wherever and, and, and whenever they might be needed in every, uh, every town and city across this country. Uh, third is to identify from a public health standpoint why we're seeing this significant increase. 
Just 10 years ago, the deaths from overdoses were about 10% of what they are right now. Uh, as was mentioned, 52,000 in 2015, approaching 60,000 in 2016, and the numbers for 2017 are no better. So there's, there's got to be an answer to the why. What, why is it that individuals are becoming addicted to a greater degree? Why is it that they've lost hope? What, what, what's going on in our society? Uh, fourth is the whole area of, of uh, uh, the kind of exciting uh, scientific discoveries that, are, that we're on the cusp of, of, uh, uh, of being able to see accomplished. Uh, pain medication that's non-euphoric so that there's no drug-seeking behavior uh, once an individual is, is given appropriately a prescription for pain medication. Uh, there's the possibility of having a, a vaccine for addiction. Uh, that, that's an exciting, incredible prospect that NIH is working on. Okay. And then I'm happy to I'm happy to go further. The fifth one is how we manage pain in this nation, um, and and we've managed it differently. And many would suggest that that part of the reason that we're having one of the challenges that we're having is because the federal government stepped in about 20 years ago and said that pain is a fifth vital sign, uh, and that that physicians and other providers were incentivized to prescribe opiate narcotics. Uh, and that began that curve, that significant curve up, or it correlates with that significant curve up. So we're working with the, the, uh, veteran, the VA administration because that's where that began uh, to try to turn, turn back that tide so that we can not have more uh, overdose deaths in this nation but, but have less. This administration is absolutely committed to turning it around. Here, and then we're gonna go. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rosenberg, can I ask you a question? Because a lot of this involves Medicare fraud, uh, and that would mean overdosing or overprescribing to seniors. In what way are they especially vulnerable to uh, overdoses of opioids? You got all these smart people up here, Pete, and you pick on me? <laughs> well, I, I think seniors have to be particularly careful for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, as you get older, you take more and more drugs, prescription medications, and so there are more dangers of drug interaction. So seniors might be more susceptible to falls or disorientation, dizziness, and opioids can exacerbate that. Um, second, seniors might not be opioid tolerant. In fact, different people have different, rea different physiological reactions to this stuff. And so if you're not opioid tolerant, but you're a senior citizen, the um, the effect can be even greater. And then third, and, and I'm, you didn't quite ask this, but I'm going to answer it anyway. Uh, seniors, because they tend to have lots of prescription drugs, tend to have lots of prescription drugs in their medicine cabinets. And so one way that everyone can help, including seniors, is to think about our national drug take back days. Can I make a pitch for that real quick? Uh, twice a year, the DEA does a national drug take back. Uh, anonymously, uh, we take your stuff, we don't read the labels, and we incinerate it. Now, here's a remarkable number, Pete. In April, when we did our last one, we took in 900,000 pounds of drugs from medicine cabinets around the country. We partnered with uh, 4,200 law enforcement agencies. We were in 5,500 sites in the United States. We're going to do this again at the end of October. And so seniors also play a big role in that. So they're more susceptible, there's more drug interaction, and they have more stuff in their medicine cabinets. Because four out of five new heroin users started on prescription pills, I should also add that most of those who started on prescription pills got it from someone who got it legitimately. And that's why you need to clean out those medicine cabinets. Question for General Sessions and uh, the DEA Administrator and who else would like to jump in on the number that you mentioned, 59,000 people dying in 2016, um, the overwhelming majority uh, involved in opioid addiction. A um, case uh, that still haunts me, uh, I think it was in Pennsylvania, of uh, both parents ODing and the infant dying uh, as a result of the parents being downstairs dead and no one to take care of the uh, infant. What's it going to take? Because obviously something's not working for the country to understand the level of this problem and the nature of the problem, and what do you think that should be? I'll let you. I would just say I think you're correct that we haven't. It hasn't dawned on this on us the enormity of the deaths that we are seeing from uh, illegal drug use. Fifty uh, two thousand, I believe, last year around fifty. Uh, we project perhaps 60,000 this year. It's still going up dramatically. In New Hampshire, uh, a few months ago, 
I was there with a large crowd of high school students. Fifty mothers stood before those kids who lost a child to drug overdose. This is very real. Uh, it's a much more death-dealing uh, crisis than we had with drugs even in the 80s. So I do think it's important. Tom, you, you, let me ask you to comment. Yeah, I, I, I've been, uh, as I mentioned, the administration is absolutely committed to stemming this tide, and I've been going around the country uh, uh, to, to communities large and small with Kellyanne Conway to, to talk with, uh, uh, with law enforcement, to talk with uh, health care providers, to talk with faith-based folks, to talk with uh, recovering addicts, recovered addicts, uh, parents of, of, of folks who have died. And I was struck by something that a recovered addict, a recovering addict, uh, said in, in Maine, and that is, if you've seen one addict, you've seen one addict. Uh, and so the, the challenge that we have is that the local communities where, where people love their neighbors and want to care for the neighbors is the key to solving this challenge. One of the biggest problems that we've got is that, is that we, we re somebody's reversed, has an overdose and, and is reversed, and then having the handoff of that person to a recovery center. Um, and oftentimes around the country right now, sadly, that reversal occurs and that individual isn't handed off to, to a recovery center for a variety of reasons. I talked to one fire, uh, fire there's a firehouse in, in West Virginia that has, a, has a, uh, a, an open door policy for folks uh, who, who uh, are overdosing. They come in and they reverse them. Uh, one fireman reversed the same young lady three times in one day. That's a system that is failing that individual when they can't take that person and get them to uh, move, move toward uh, recovery. So we're working with the local communities. We were in Chattanooga just uh, just last week uh, that, that is doing incredible things and beginning to see a turning of that curve of, of, of increasing not just addiction but, uh, but uh, overdose deaths. Uh, and so it, 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 it's different for every single person, but what that means is that we've got to be as attentive as we can be to all of the strategy elements that I outlined uh, earlier. Uh, and, and this administration is committed to doing just that. All right, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.